Hello Hasbro fans, this is Sephardus Destroyers with a Star Wars The Clone Wars figure review. And this figure is the Vajo Press, and this is the shirtless version. Packings included, dice, stand, character card. It's weird how um, the card shows the Vajo Press holding the lightsaber, but the figure doesn't come with a lightsaber, nor on the show. The Savage up first wheel that likes it when he's in his shirtless gear. Picture of Savage up first there. So is the Clone Wars logo there. And down here, Clone Wars 55. Back of the packaging, you have the kit play feature, which is the firing battle axe. There's the battle axe there. And there's a prototype image of Savage up first. And there's a picture of, of Savage Hope Fest in the episode Monster Killing Jedi Master Hossie. What's weird though is the picture shows him in his armored gear. And yeah, this is a shirtless figure. It doesn't really make sense, but whatever. Other figures in this wave include Clone Wars 38, Clone Commando Jet, Clone Wars 39, Honda and Knocker, Clone Wars 53, Plo Koon, and Clone Wars 56, RF Trooper. That's enough of the packaging. Now onto the accessories. First up, you get that fine battle axe, which really is just a pathetic kid feature accessory. And seeing as I'm a collector, I really couldn't care less for this. And I don't even want to show you the kid play feature because it's actually terrible. It's this little thing here. You're meant to pull it out, but it's really hard to do, and it's quite frustrating at times. It does have some nice detail and coloring on it, but. Overall, it fails even at being a kid play feature because some kids might not be strong enough to pull this thing out. So, it's a waste of an accessory for both collectors and kids. The other one, though, is much better. And this is the collector focus accessory, the actual weapon, pike axe, whatever you want to call it, that he uses in Monster when killing Master Halsey, Padawan Knox, and all those clone troopers. Yeah, there's some great detail in on it and looks really cool. Great accessory there. Um, now I'll take a look at the figure now. You'll notice he's very yellow. He's act the armored version actually is much better yellow, more screen accurate. This one is just way too bright, if you know what I'm saying. The sister cool figure, but the yellow is just too bright on him. Now if here's the face sculpt, it's, well the head sculpt actually. It's nicely detailed, but the expression just kills the face sculpt, really. It's a terrible expression. It's just so funky looking. What I do really like about the face sculpt is the horns. I mean, sometimes Hasbro will give us pathetic horns that are just too weak and rubbery. These are more collector-focused than hard, so it's better for collectors, but... Yeah, I definitely prefer that. Articulation, head... Shoulders, elbows, wrists, and knees. No ankles, unfortunately. That's a trend with non-clone figures. Well, most non-clone figures. So not really much of a surprise there. Give you a look at the back of the figure now. Got some great detailing with those birthmarks there. As well as on the shoulders. Now, I'm going to go ahead and rate the shirtless of our ship for this figure. I'd say 8.5 out of 10. What kills this figure for me from being any higher is the funky expression, that lame kid feature accessory, and the lack of anchor articulation. Even though there is a better version out there of Savage Hope Fest, which is the version, I still recommend you should pick this up. It is a pretty unique figure for us. It does look really cool. It has some great detailing on it. And I definitely recommend you pick this figure up. Because Savage Hope Fest is a really cool character. He's going to be coming back later in Season 4. And you might want to get a figure of him. The shirt that Savage Hope Fest hasn't been hard to find really that much. Harder than the rest of the wave actually, but with his repack in 2012's first wave, he shouldn't at all be hard to find, so I won't worry about missing out on them. Hope you all have enjoyed this review, may the force be with you, and happy hunting. Hello Star Wars the Clone Wars fans, this is Separatist Destroyers. 
with a Star Wars The Clone Wars episode review, and this review will be about the episode A Friend in Need. Now, A Friend in Need was a very controversial episode, I put it mildly, because we had Lux Bon Terry, of course, returning from the season 3 episode Heroes on both sides, so we knew that relationship or friendship, whichever term you prefer, between him and Ahsoka Tano would definitely be explored again in this episode, even before it aired. First thing, the topic I'd like to talk about though is not Lux or Ahsoka or even Dooku, it's the Commando droids actually. We saw quite a fair few in the first few minutes of the episode. Now, I'm wondering how many of you can remember back in season one in their debut in the episode Rookies, well, Commander Cody, you couldn't even take out a commando droid with 10 blaster bolts. Uh, but ever since then, they've steadily been growing weaker and weaker, the commando droids. And now in this episode, Ahsoka took one out with a kick. In fact, she took both out with one kick each. And that just shows how weak they've become because one blaster bolt is actually stronger than a kick in the Star Wars universe. So... The way the commando droids have been portrayed for a while now, getting weaker and weaker, really needs to be fixed because back in Rookies they were really strong opponents for their clones and Jedi and the Republic in general, but now they're just pushovers, pretty much as weak as the B1 battle droids now. Anyway, next topic is a separatist council. Now, my fellow YouTube fan Dan Grievous is a big separatist council, council fan. And I can't understand where all these complaints, I mean, and the people who oppose what he says, well, I mean, you get your Anakin, Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, whichever Jedi, whatever, every other week. I mean, people like me, Dan, and a few others I know, like Battelle Laboratories, I think that's why he's called Mike, and um, others want their separatists and we haven't actually had a separatist council leader since season two which is why all the complaints are coming in and that was Poggle the Lesser and that was as long ago as over two seasons ago in fact it was like before to face the ten had even begun we actually originally meant to have Ticus the Quarren for in the episode Prisoners but he was eventually scrapped late introduction so we never got him and we really need CIS council leaders I mean I don't know if he is you know see is like Tambor and Pogler in prison and they need to be out by Revenge of the Sith Boba Fett and Bosk to name a few don't need to be out until Empire Strikes Back and instead we're getting up for some fake of them in and not Tambor and Pogler and they're the ones who need it more so don't know where Felonia is coming from here. Next discussion is topic is Count Dooku and how he is overused. I mean, it was perfect in season one. They really did good stories with him in season one, season two, and season season three, I should say. And season two had little to none of Dooku. He never really got proper appearance of season. That was actually really good because we got to explore other stories. But for the first three seasons, they were okay in using Dooku. But season 4, he's just been overused completely. And now, we had an Anakin duo film in Shadow Area and another one in Escape from Kedavra. We're going to have another one soon before the end of the season. I mean, is it just me or does my power of doubles since last time we met Kemp not even matter in the universe anymore? It just seems so pointless now. And we, there's so many other villains out there to use. We don't need to use Dooku all the time. Finally, the topic you've all been waiting for, or not, is Lux Montaigne and Ahsoka Tana. Now, they both gave, gave both characters a lot of character of them in this episode, which is really fun to see. But uh, if I was the one writing this episode, I would have left out their kiss for another couple of episodes. Because I think it was too rushed. I'm, that's just my opinion, but whatever. And I mean... The method was unconventional, to say the least, because it's quite a weird way in which to have the kiss, but it was coming, that was the obvious thing. And next up, Anakin Skywalk. I mean, going back to Ticus and the Separatists in general, I mean, 
they can't squeeze him in to prisoners, even though they had fully designed the model, you can actually find it in the trivia on the StarWars.com episode guide for prisoners, the model of Ticus for the show. Um, they can't squeeze him in with the model complete, but they can squeeze Anakin, who must be my least favourite character on the show right now, in. I mean, don't get me wrong, Anakin's cool in the movies and all, but the Clone Wars has completely ruined his portrayal. And that's nothing against the voice actor for Anakin Matland. He does a great job, but the character Anakin as a whole and the way the writers are doing him is the problem. Now, the best thing about this episode for me and many other fans is Fee Vistler and the Death Watch. I mean, they're really good in this episode. Fee Vistler, it was very cool to see more of him explored. My one complaint, though, with his exploration is... And there was one point where he pointed out his skirt at Lux. I mean, it's pretty much saying, Oh, you could have seen this, but instead you had to go through those terrible tea episodes. And that was just really annoying because it's so true. I mean, because he got that from Dooku, he said that. And we could have seen an epic episode or two where Fissler, uh, uh, the watch against the Separatists, where Dooku gives Fissler that sky. So yeah, that's one complaint I have about it, but he actually does look really cool in all that new gear. And I actually think while it was cool when he had hair, I think the bald design he now has adds a lot more depth to the character from my point of view. And Death Watch's story is really cool now with um, the way that their armor is being changed because they have to change from planet to planet. And all that sort of thing. And next up, the main Po people. They were the random villagers, really, that demanded they get their people back from Death Watch. And I absolutely hated uh, the pe these people. They were so stupid. Especially as they actually replaced the Yak Face species who are meant to be in this episode. I mean, who won't be sympathetic or more sympathetic to something with puppy dog eyes, sort of? I mean, the main Pope people were just stupid. I actually had more sympathy for those, like, droids that I too had to reassemble. And those droids are actually so much killing these people. And I was like, when a Chieftain Pyder, I think his name was, asked, demanded Vista give his people back to him, I was just going mental. I was actually hoping this would kill them all, but I wasn't so sure the show had the ball to do that. And I was pleasantly surprised that they did kill them all. So I was actually really delighted that with that. I know some of you may not be, but that's just me. I loved that part when they used the flame force to burn the buildings down. And this was like, kill them. Kill them all. Yeah. Next up, the animation oh, just got even better in this episode. They really did a great job of the animation, especially in the shot that I played. As part of the introduction to this episode when this uh, was like, welcome to Death Watch and all that. The animation, that was brilliant because they were doing several different things at once. Fire, snow, wind, lots of different things. Anyway, I'm going to give this episode a rating of 9 out of 10. It was really good, had some great action. One, my one complaint with really this episode, it had quite some weird moments like bo on the new Mandalorian female touching a Sokotano on the butt, so oh, that was a weird scene. Anyway, Dave Filoni confirmed on his Facebook page we're going to be seeing Death Watch again in Season 5 where Fist and bo return. returned. bo would this time remove her helmet. And he also said we'd be seeing a preview clip of Death Watch at Celebration 6, I believe it is, in August. So that'll be something to look forward to. Anyway, next week's episode is Deception. And Obi-Wan is going to have to fake his death in that episode. We're going to see a bounty on his return. And then there's going to be new bounty hunters. There's one guy, Reiko Haditi or something. I'm not actually too sure how you spell that. But he's going to be a new one. He's going to be the one to actually snipe Obi-Wan and wound him. The preview clip of Obi-Wan's death scene is actually really touching. Even though we knew he won't be dead, but was still brilliant for what it was. 
There's going to be lots of fan favorite bands returning in this four part upcoming act, such as Cad Bane, Ambo, Boba Fett Bosk, and we might even be seeing the debut of my all time ultimate favorite band under, and that is the awesomeness character that is Dengar. If you don't know who he is, then look him up on Wikipedia. He's an awesome bounty hunter with a great backstory, and I can't wait to see him in Star Wars The Clone Wars soon. See ya.